to my left is uh, the very courageous survivor, Linda Carroll, who uh, filed suit uh, late yesterday um, against uh, the Diocese of Crookston and its officials, the Diocese of Fall River and their officials, and the religious order of priests the treat offenders known as the servants of Paraclete. This case was filed in Polk County and it is um, filed on behalf of Jane Doe 24. And this is Jane Doe 24 that uh, stands with me today. And she has made the choice to stand here today to use her name uh, and her voice and uh, uh, speak to why she's chosen to take this action. Before um, she does speak to that, um, I think it deserves to be noted that the offender in this case is a well-known, highly publicized serial predator by the name of James Porter. Porter is deceased. Uh, he's a priest that came from Fall River. And there he abused countless kids and it became known in the 90s that he did. And it also became known that he'd been moved from Fall River to uh, treatment at the Servants of Paraclete in New Mexico. And it also became known that he was then sent to Minnesota at a treatment center in Bemidji and placed in a parish where Linda and many other innocent kids uh, were in the school at St. Philip's. And there he abused repeatedly <laughs> countless kids. We came forward in the early 1990s to expose that long-standing pattern. And many of the men that made the choices to conceal this offender and uh, to keep it a secret um, are dead um, and no longer with us but the practices and the protocols they employed to protect this offender that caused these children to be harmed are unfortunately still alive and still very real and still in place in the Diocese of Crookston and other dioceses like it and they have yet to come fully clean with their history and in the absence of that uh, we and the courage of Linda chose to bring this case uh, first for public nuisance against each of these institutions for uh, and because each of them choose to keep secrets, choose to protect themselves at the peril of children and from the past and to today, and for that reason continue to create a public hazard or nuisance. And it's for that reason that we applaud this legal action and really seek to get uh, the Diocese of Crookston here in Minnesota in particular to come clean, accountable, and transparent. They have fought uh, hard to keep uh, their secrets and the names of their offenders, both accused and credibly accused, and the files. And this suit seeks to disgorge that information, to force them to be transparent and accountable. And so uh, we do applaud um, Linda for bringing the action as Jane Doe and choosing to do something uh, to protect others and address these dangerous and reckless practices. And we also applaud you, uh, Linda, for standing here today. And so um, with that, I'd like you to introduce yourself and tell us what prompted you to take this action. Um, I'm just, do you mind if we put you in front of the microphones? Maybe even sure. move the mics a little closer. Thank you so much. Thank I'm, you for being here. <laughs> I'm Linda Carroll. 
and I'm really bad at this. <laughs> I'm today, here today as a survivor, and no longer a victim. And I want anyone out there who's had to go through this to do something about it. Because you're not alone. And there's a lot of people that will help. And I've suffered with depression my whole life. And I'm done. I'm not standing in the shadows. And I'm not ashamed. And I'm not going away. And I don't care how long it takes. I don't think what they're doing is right. I don't think what they've done for years is right and it hasn't changed. And it needs to change. And Linda, um, we know you were abused by this offender and you're holding a picture here. Uh, tell us about this picture and uh, um, how old you were. I was seven and uh, tell us how uh, then Father James Porter came into your life and that of your family. He used to come to our home a couple nights a week. He would bring my brother home from baseball or basketball and he'd sit and drink coffee with my mom and then he would play in our basement with all of us kids. And he pretty much had free reign because he was a priest. And uh, Linda, you're now 51 years old. Um, tell us um, how it is that, you know, you are, uh, you weren't able to talk about this for years. No one wanted to hear it. No one thought that he touched the girls or had anything to do with the little girls, and that's not true. And the church didn't want to hear it, and the families didn't want to talk about it. They just wanted it to go away, and it hasn't gone away. And, um, while Porter has gone away, the legacy um, that he and the top officials uh, left is evergreen, and that is a legacy of, dis of secrecy and self-protection. The timeline um, in your packet reflects that he was you know, ordained in 60, caught in the early 60s having abused dozens of kids in Fall River. The timeline and the records that we have, including his removal from the priesthood by the Vatican, show that he uh, was moved by the bishop in Fall River because of the heat there to the servants of Paraclete to get treated and recycled, where he was allowed to work in parishes and abused there in New Mexico and then in Texas, and then continued to abuse and was sent to Minnesota, where he was sent to our Lady of Snows in Nevis, Minnesota, in the Bemidji area, where Linda and her family and many other kids trusted this priest at St. Philip's School, and uh, where he abused many kids. And that became known in the early 90s. The sad uh, part about this is not that he was allowed, just that he was allowed to continue his predatory ways, but that the bishops and top officials made conscious choices to protect him and themselves. And the same kind of choices that the bishop of the Diocese of Crookston is making today to keep secrets, that cause us the need to bring this action. The kind of attitude that pervaded then that caused this harm is still reflective in the documents here. And when we look at a letter in 1970 from uh, the General Superior of the Servants of Paraclete, the Treatment Center, 
to a, a top official of the Diocese of Fall River, he says to the bishop, Your Excellency, two weeks ago Father James Porter arrived here at St. Michael's for what we thought was his annual vacation. A few days ago we were informed by his pastor, Monsignor Lemon of Bemidji, Minnesota, that Father Porter had lapsed into his old problem and that the heat was on, so Father was directed to seek the help of the paracletes again. So every time he got caught from the early 60s abusing kids, they considered it heat and transferred him to another location where he had access to more kids. And every time he got caught again, time and time again, the response of the Catholic bishops, the servants of paracletes who worked for them and were funded by them to treat these people, was to keep it secret and avoid the heat, which means avoid scandal. So this action is designed and on the courage of Linda and others that have gone before, is designed to address the institutional problem, the organizational um, deception and adherence to secrecy that remains in place and that is demonstrated in these not-so-agent documents. And uh, for that reason, um, Linda chose to say, I don't want to be a Jane Doe anymore. I want to be a person that stands up um, for those that have been harmed and for those that won't be if I do. So Linda, tell us a little about the decision that you made to not be a Jane Doe because the law under the Child Victims Act protects your identity and you didn't have to come here today and you didn't have to use your name. Tell us what led you to come here and stand with us today. There's just too many secrets. And by not giving a name, it just, people, you have to put a name and a face to it. Because otherwise people don't get it. They see Jane Doe number 24 and doesn't really mean anything until they actually see a person that it's affected. And uh, Linda also chose to come out of the the, uh, uh, the kind of the shadows and the the Jane Doe 24 because I think you expressed you wanted people to know some of the pain that you've endured since the age of seven when yeah. you're in the second grade. <laughs> And um, you don't have to go too deep into this, but tell us a little bit about um, how it felt and how it ha has shaped your life. Um, well, I mentioned before, I've had depression pretty much my whole life. Um, I don't trust people. I don't sleep at night. I've gone to therapy and spent many hours and a lot of drugs <laughs> trying to just function and it's some days it's easier some days it's, it's much harder and I felt that if I could stand up and say this happened that it would just go a long way to my healing and to my recovery. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, Alinda. Uh, because this really is addressing the institutional and organizational practices that are so reckless and so dangerous that adhere to secrecy, um, it also needs to be said that historically law enforcement and um, legislatures have protected offenders and those that have chosen to protect them. But because of the Child Victims Act that was passed in Minnesota, Linda is given a chance to have a voice, not only to bring a suit anonymously, but a chance to speak before you today and make this history that is now documented and available on our website 
um, known to the public and expose the dangerous practices that we believe remain and in place that we hope to address um, through the public nuisance action that has, that has already given us some traction here in the Twin Cities.